Can you hear us now? Yes. There we go. Are you Facebook? Hey, Dan, it'll just be a second. They're connecting to Facebook Live right now. Okay. All right. Okay, Dan. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Uh... Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, August virtual meeting. And uh, hope that everyone's been able to be healthy and safe since our last meeting. And as a reminder, the public is able to view our meeting in real time on Facebook Live. So we greet all of you who are joining this evening and glad you're with us. So I'd now like to call the regular board meeting to order. Meeting called at 6.02. We'll have a roll call. Jim Anderson. Present. Dr. Falvo Lane. Here. Roger Gines. Maria Higgy. Here. Carmelita Smith. <clears throat> I think she, uh, uh, Carmelita, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes. We're doing roll call. Carmelita Smith. Yes. Uh, Cindy Sutter. Here. And Dan Sutter, I'm here. So, all right, well, thank you. And, um, and we go to In Memoriam. We extend our sincere condolences to families of the following people who have passed away since our last meeting. Uh, uh, several of those that we have served. Um, Kyle David Kotcher, Kyle, age 43, passed away on Tuesday, June 23rd. He received services from SSA department previously attended the Start TV workshop program. Leroy Frederick Copeland, Leroy, age 51, passed away on Wednesday, July 15th. He received services from the SSA department. Danny Lee Marcus, Danny, age 65, passed away Friday, uh, July 17th. He received services from the SSA department. Uh, Daniel Irvin Slutz, Danny, age 73, passed away Saturday, July 25th. He received services from the SSA department prior to his move to Florida. Larry Allen Smith, Larry, age 62, passed away on Wednesday, July 29th. He received services from the SSA department. Megan Rose Eli, Megan, age 12, passed away on Saturday, August 1st. She received services from the SSA department. Lamar, Lamar, or Joe Bowman, Joe, age 29, passed away Sunday, August 9th. He received services from the SSA department and previously was involved with the Stark County Board of DD Supported Employment Services. He was the winner of the logo contest for the 15th annual Great Pumpkin Race in 2012. Victoria uh, Jean Nolan. Vicki, age 69, 66, passed away Sunday, August 9th. She received services from the SSA department. Donna Marie Puth, Donna, age 83, passed away Monday, August 10th. She received services from the SSA department and had worked in the Stark County Board of DD Workshop Program for 25 years. And then we have um, uh, two people from our staff, Anita Rodriguez, Anita, age 76, passed away Sunday, June 21st. She worked in adult services until her retirement in 2014. Linda Allison, Linda, age 64, passed away Saturday, August 8th. She had worked for the board for 17 years. She was currently an SSA, but previously worked in adult services. If we could have a moment of silence in your honor. Okay, thank you. I now need a motion to approve minutes from the regular board meeting held June 23rd. Hickey moves. Second? Second. Any additions, revisions, or corrections? 
I just had one question uh, on the uh, cost of the uh, furniture. What was the uh, final cost from Temple uh, Square? Is it? <laughs> it just said it was. It just said all the bids after he made a re revision. All the bids. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I got. I'm back <laughs> Yeah, all, Roger, all the furniture, including the carpeting, was under the estimated $70,000, if that helps. But it was? So. The 70000 was our budget, but we were we were under that for the quote. I believe it came in, and you'll have to ask Tim, um, let's see, around forty forty five thousand, 45000 I believe. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. For all the furniture and then the carpet was about 18,000. So everything came under what we budgeted. Good. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. It all it said was that it came under budget the second mm -hmm. time around. So. Yeah, I think we actually paid both furniture in June and July and both payments were about 20 grand each. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No, thank you, Lee. So, um, with that, all in favor of approval of board meeting minutes, say aye. 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 Post say nay. No abstentions. Minutes are approved. Okay, we at, the, at this time, we'll entertain anyone for public speaks. We do have someone scheduled, so please indicate your name and address. Each speaker is limited to three minutes unless additional time is extended by the board. Um, and also like to announce that the board will, will be taking no action will be and direct the superintendent to respond within 30 days in writing of any complaint or concern. With that, we can proceed with public speaks. Oh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hello. I guess it's my turn. I was unmuted. Um, yeah. I appreciate we, we, can, we can hear you, but we can't see you, but that, that's okay. Please, please go ahead. I'll let you see me. Uh, it's not letting me undo that. I'm sorry, I can't I can't undo my camera. Um, I, no. My name is Kathy Catazero Perry, and um, I wanted to address the board this evening because uh, I am an advocate for special needs children. Many of you hey, know hey, my special yeah, needs children. Um, I'm sorry. You were, you need to uh, uh, say your name and your address. Sorry about that. That's okay. 900 yeah. Mill Ridge Path, Masson, Ohio, 44646. Many of you know me, and I'm an advocate for special needs children, and tonight I'm advocating for my daughter. Um, I applied for a waiver. This is the third time, denied for three times. Um, but <clears throat> uh, what I'm understanding is that... Um, until the child reaches 18, the DD uh, board does not want to approve waivers uh, because it's a responsibility of the school. And during her, I cannot hear her. Oh, I can, I can hear. Her. I can too. So, should I continue? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's okay to proceed. I think she's having some technical difficulties. But she should be joining us back on soon. You there, Carmelita? So, um, yeah, please go ahead. So, uh, what I understand is that the school should be responding to our needs and um, my daughter has Down syndrome. She's a praxic. Uh, she catches everything of talking about viruses and bacterial infections. So she cannot go to school uh, during this pandemic. She is now at home trying to, uh, and she also has a one-on-one -on -one that is with her all day when she is in school. And the school is refusing to bring the aid to the house. Um, she is not attentive. She uh, lays on the floor at times. I have to redirect her. And, um, you know, so what I'm approaching the board tonight for is that the family should not be in the middle of, of this, uh, you know, that the, the DD can't support the child. 
and the school's not supporting the child. Families should not be in the middle of this um, argument. And uh, families with special needs need support. I know I'm not the only one that's going through this, uh, but there's no more risk of coming into our home than there is for Vanessa. There's a greater risk for her to go to the school. Um, I did have an IEP meeting today and uh, with no result. So I just like to ask the board to address this uh, and Mr. Green to address this because this is a, a problem and the pandemic is not going away anytime soon. And I'm sure I've reached my three minutes. So I appreciate your time tonight. I think Brandon was keeping time and we had a, we had a, uh, a, a an interruption there, but um, so are, are you uh, finished then or? Uh... Yes, I appreciate your time. Okay, yeah, th uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for for sharing your the, this heartfelt issue and the issues you're facing advocating for others uh, that could be uh, similar situated. And I announced earlier, the super, superintendent, Bill Green, will be responding to you within 30 days, and I'm sure it'll, it'll be sooner. Um, if the board does have any questions, we will request Bill as a superintendent to follow up with you on our behalf. Uh, we know that similar issues are occurring all over the state in other counties, and we're working with local school districts and the Ohio Department of Education to come up with uh, remedies. And, uh, thank you again for speaking to us. Um, thank you. Later, uh, later in the meeting, I'd like to call for an executive session so that the board can meet to discuss matters required to uh, be kept confidential by federal law and regu regulations or state statutes. Uh, we will not be taking any action upon the conclusion of the executive session, and then we'll move for adjournment. Um, so sorry to interrupt you there, Kathy, but uh, uh, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll move uh, to the president's report. So on, on Monday, yesterday, I had the opportunity to participate in the 10th annual Citizens Who Care for Golf Audi, assisting in raising public awareness for our mission, as well as raising money for our levy campaigns. Um, was one of 116 golfers who participated, which was an excellent turnout. I think we, on a, on a normal non-pandemic year, we have close to 130. Or, or that that might have been our, our record, actually, 130. But it was another great great event, and uh, a good time was had by everyone. And I want to extend my special thanks to the appreciation to Lisa Paramore, who's chair chairperson for the event, as well as everyone who worked on the committee. Uh, I can't say enough about it. It was just a stupendous uh, day. It was, it was fantastic. Um, also want to extend my appreciation to the Ohio County Board Association, the 88 County Boards of DD and the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities for their efforts to provide financial assistance to our uh, homemaker personal care providers. $17 million the state of Ohio is contributing with the uh, 88 county boards providing over $4 million will be, will be able to bring nearly $77 million to assist homemaker personal care providers in Ohio. This concludes the president's report. Hey, Dan, uh, is there no recognition of at retirees tonight? Um, there is. There is? Okay. There. <laughs> Did I pass that up? No, I must have. So, do we want to uh, pause and take? Let's take recognition of the retirees. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, sorry about that. It's okay. Good. Good evening, everyone. Can, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, we're recognizing four retirees that retired through the spring and summer of this year. Um, first, we have uh, Debbie O'Brien. Debbie was a bus rider in our transportation department for 17 years. And here you see a few candid shots of Debbie enjoying some time away from work and also receiving a painting from her supervisor, Diane Sidwell. 
Next, we have Kim Goodrich. <laughs> Kim retired from Eastgate Preschool after 11 years of service, and Kim was an intervention specialist assistant. And here you see Kim enjoying some activities at East School, Eastgate with coworkers and her preschool kids. Cheryl Lovejoy. Cheryl retired after 30 years of service. She worked in our IT central records department as a clerk, but prior to that, for many years, Cheryl was a custodian. And here is Cheryl enjoying some board related activities with coworkers. And lastly, we have Pam Strickmaker. Pam was a bus rider in our transportation department and she worked for the board for 21 years. And here Pam is again enjoying some activities with her coworkers at the transportation department. So we do want to express our appreciation and thanks to these Stark DD employees for their commitment and years of service and wish them well and a happy and long retirement. Okay, thank you, Connie. I wish we could uh, do this in person, but uh, like other companies and all that, this is kind of the way we have to handle it. You, you did that very well, so it was, it was good recognition. Thank you. Move on to the superintendent's report. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is well on this Tuesday evening. It's certainly been a beautiful day. Uh, I do want to uh, just uh, touch on uh, Again, the public speaks and uh, the plea from uh, the Perry's uh, about their daughter. And uh, just so you know, we uh, we will be working with the school district to see if we can come to resolution um, and have been working with them uh, from Friday uh, through uh, today trying to come to a resolution. So um, uh, we'll be, uh, so I just want to let everyone know, especially the board, in regards to these very difficult situations that families face every day and uh, our role in addressing them. So um, we certainly uh, heard loud and clear um, uh, Kathy's plea. So I want, want each of you to know uh, that and that obviously she doesn't stand alone, but uh, there's a host of families uh, that are Similarly situated, and I know she was speaking for them as well. Um, I do want to uh, uh, kind of piggyback on some of Dan's comments about the uh, provider financial incentive uh, they will be receiving, which will be about two and a half weeks of their billing uh, that they'll receive as kind of a lump sum payment. Uh, the, our provider community has been working. Uh, tirelessly uh, through this uh, pandemic uh, with a uh, lots of overtime, added costs with uh, PPE uh, need for purchases, which we've been assisting with. Uh, but uh, uh, so we are very, very excited about this and that we're able to partner with um, the Department of Developmental Disabilities to uh, bring this to fruition. Uh, we had a provider meeting today and again, our providers here have been uh, strong, but they are, they are plagued with the same issues that we're seeing across the state. Very difficult recruiting uh, quality uh, direct support professionals. And then once they recruit them, being able to retain them. So uh, we're wor working with them and uh, coming alongside them wherever we can to, to help out. Uh, but uh, it's still a, a problem that plagues our service delivery system is quality, reliable providers that parents can count on. If they're supposed to be there at seven, but they're there at seven. So, uh, so we're, we're uh, working hand in hand with them to, uh, again, with that recruitment and retention component. So, and certainly with our Gold Star providers collaborative. Um, I do want to uh, sing the praises of our kind of our our school restart committee with Myrna Blosser and with uh, Tammy Maney and Kristen Quichi and Lisa Paramore, uh, Diane Sidwell and uh, Tim Beard, who all have direct uh, uh, 
responsibilities for our staff that are back. Um, it's just been, uh, it's certainly been a labor of love and planning uh, for everyone's safety. Now we're delivering and uh, Tammy and Myrna are gonna be talking about that very shortly. But what I do wanna conclude uh, uh, the superintendent's report uh, with uh, a retirement announcement uh, for Myrna Blosser. Uh, she has formally notified us that she'll be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, again, just has been a faithful servant for 30 plus years. And it's going to be, uh, again, it is bittersweet for her. And uh, we just uh, wish her well uh, as she uh, kind of closes a chapter and opens another one. Uh, but she has been one of those good and faithful servants. Uh, she will indeed have uh, four more months of uncertainty and uh, dealing with uh, a lot of times some getting more questions than we have answers, but she has been a trooper uh, all along, but especially this year. So I did want to make that announcement and we'll be sharing this with staff tomorrow uh, for those that haven't been a part of this. But uh, when, you, when you look at someone that has been here 31 plus years, I mean, it is, uh, we, are, we will feel it and uh, we just wish her uh, well for the best. So, uh, Congratulations to her and sad for us. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the superintendent's report. We'll give her a tier two. Yeah. I don't know how an applause comes through. <laughs> but we just did it. So. No, yeah. We'll have to enjoy our final four months with uh, Myrna. And, and uh, yeah, after, and uh, we'll, we'll be missing you, but uh, we'll enjoy our next four months. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Bill. And uh, move on to the committee and department reports. They're in our board packet. So, are there any additions or deletions that need to be made at this time? Okay. With none, there's a there is a presentation this evening. Tammy Maney, early childhood uh, director, and Bruno Blosser. Uh, school age principal will provide us with an update. So, Tammy, you'll be on first. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. And I'm pleased to welcome you to Star TV's preschool um, for the 2021 school year. Following our original Department of Ed preschool regs that we were given for our COVID year, our classes do have nine students, typically six with IEPs and three typically developing peers. ODE has raised those numbers. We are allowed to be up to 16 once again, but um, with the large numbers that we graduated in May, and with the number of parents who had been referred to us, but who have since opted to just do itinerant services with their district, we have been able to maintain our numbers at nine. So under the COVID restrictions and everything that we want to do, we are happy with these small classes. Um, we do have 39 students who have IEPs. Those numbers that keep inching up a little bit. Um, those 39 are doing in-person learning in our eight classes. We do have two students who were with us last year who have chosen to do remote learning with us. We may have a third going on remote soon. Uh, we do have one more student with an IEP who's in process. We're just waiting for the district to finish that evaluation. And we have 26 typically developing peers. We did, we had a quiet summer staff-wise we did have a couple retirements, but it only resulted in adding one new teacher assistant, and we were very pleased to be able to promote someone who had been a longtime sub and follow along with us, and so she now is our new full-time assistant. 
Um, we are very excited to be back in the business of educating children. I was teasing with the staff on Friday when I met to thank them for all of their hard work and preparation that um, the students were not going to know what hit them this week because the staff is absolutely giddy about after five months mm -hmm. being able to get their hands on the kids again. Um, but I thought I would show you tonight how we have adjusted for COVID-19. As you'll hear from Myrna, and you probably already have heard, Southgate is on a, a adjusted schedule this year, and students are coming because of crowding issues at Southgate. Students are coming on a color-coded system in the building two days a week. So because of our dual routing, that also affected preschool. And Diane said, we'll always write a wonderful letter going to the parents, telling them their bus number and pickup time. But I was afraid this year they're going to see their letter with two different bus numbers on it and different pickup times for each bus and not understand what that was all about. So I created an individualized letter for each parent, an individual calendar for each parent that went out in their packet showing the days that they are riding their, their red bus because it's a different number and it's different pickup and drop off times and the days that they're riding their yellow bus. And we have heard from several parents who um, are leaning on that and we're appreciative of getting that. So I was glad that we were able to do that. Um, another thing that we have done that's different, every year the first week before school starts, so last week, the staff typically makes home visits and they, uh, we're not able to do that last week because of COVID. We also end that home visit week typically with a big open house and we couldn't do that. We couldn't have 250 people in the building at one time. So as a result, I developed a schedule. So for four days last week, we had just one-on-one -on -one open houses. So every family was given a 45 minute time slot. We did not have more than two families in the building at a time. And if it was a situation where there was more than one child in the family attending here, they had that whole time slot because they split between their classes. So they each came in one at a time the, um, and got to meet with the classroom teacher, the therapist, and that kind of thing. And our staff actually really liked it and have asked if we can do that again in future years. Uh, that we also, our nurse was also able to meet individually with the families, maybe review some medical information. She maybe had questions of, went over our COVID-19 procedures. And we had 91.5% of our families attend these one-on-one -on -one open houses. And we had another 3% call in, students who were here last year, they called in and did phone meetings with their teachers. So we were very, very pleased with that outcome. Uh, all of the adults that attended wore masks. They were told ahead of time that everyone was required to wear masks. And as you see in the picture, many of our students did too. I, um, I like this picture because it points out the little girl on the right was here last year. They look like they could be twins, but there's, there's only 11 months between them in age. But she was here last year. And when I asked if I could take their picture, she just stepped right on up and posed for me. And her little brother who's new to us, he hid behind mom. We also uh, have been able to, because of the departure of early intervention, moving to Whippledale, we don't have to go to an, an abbreviated attendance because uh, we have the room now at the former EIN to spread out. So each of the preschool classes at Eastgate has an additional, what we're calling an annex room in the form of EI end. Now EI, as you see in the picture on the left, they were very kind to preschool and they left many things behind for us. And so, uh, and this is just one room. We had about five rooms with a whole of things they thought maybe preschool staff could use, but it's turned out to be very beneficial for us in this year as we've outfitted these separate rooms. I'm not allowing any class to have whole group activities because even though there's only nine and our classrooms, we could space them out enough, but they're only three and four or five year olds. And so that attention span, if they get too far away from the teacher doing the instruction, we're gonna lose their attention. So we are not doing whole group activities because they would have to be too close. Three and four year olds don't cover their faces when they sneeze or when they cough. They put their fingers in the mouth, they touch each other. And so we're able to split up. And when there are whole group activities, 
they're doing abbreviated, only four or five kiddos with circle and the other four or five are going down to the annex room, maybe to do an art activity or to do puzzles, that kind of thing. Every classroom is using their annex room a little differently and that I allowed that up to them, what works best for them. They also can take their naps down here. So each room has their own nap room instead of a congregate nap room as we've used in the past. We also, to accommodate the pandemic, we have um, added dividers to the cafeteria. We are using the cafeteria for lunch because the majority of our classrooms are carpeted. So we have to have students on the carpet eating and chocolate milk and such spilled in the carpet would not be good. Or on the linoleum floor, having peaches and broccoli spilled on the floor. Um, you've never seen anything till you've seen the cafeteria after our students eat. So having those kinds of things on the floor present a fall hazard. So we have dividers splitting the cafeteria in half. There's only two classes in there at a time, one on each side of the divider and they're on opposite ends of the cafeteria. And for our first two days, it's worked wonderfully. It is a nice, um, the kids don't see anybody on the other side, so they aren't even tempted to get up so far. We also have developed a schedule for gym and playground for recess, and it's only one class at a time, no open gym or recess times this year, and staff then are wiping down as you, like the handles on this trampoline or the handholds on the climbing wall in the back there. So they're wiping down all this equipment before the next class comes in. And then if you see, this is Dominic, this is Lee's son here in this little picture on the right. Um, you see that plastic bin there. Every child has their own bin with their own work supplies, so we are not sharing any kind of supplies um, within the classroom. For our first couple days, we always, um, we have half the students the first day, the other half the second day, then our third day, everybody comes. But we always, on those first two days, do a fire drill, so the staff is able to prepare just half the class at a time, um, talk about the loud noise, make sure they're holding enough hands while they're going outside. And I didn't um, feature Dominic on purpose uh, in two pictures, but this picture of the fire drill was perfect because preschoolers with their fingers in their ears is pretty normal for a preschool fire drill. Um, our little guy in the middle here, he is just a tiny little thing, but boy, was he a trooper. He has two older brothers who came, who come to school here, and this is their second year and mom decided to bring him to school yesterday morning. And um, I saw him crying after the two brothers left and I thought he didn't wanna leave his mom. Well, here, I went to go get him and um, he was crying because he thought the brothers left and he wasn't gonna to get to go to school. He didn't wanna go with mom. He took my hand to walk down his room, turned around, waved goodbye to his mom and he was off. He just turned three two weeks ago. He is super. And then our, our final picture here, Dev Carthy, um, not too long after I took this picture of him on the little um, trampoline in the classroom, he was zonked. In fact, when they called buses, he um, didn't wake up. They, he wouldn't wake up to walk out. One of the staff members carried him to the bus. He never woke up. Woke up. The whole time they were putting his car seat on him, um, securing the harness, he didn't wake up at all. I guess they had to basically carry him off the bus. Um, we do have, you see, some students wearing masks. Of course, the staff are wearing masks. And these are just a few pictures. And I did have to include the one of the boy on the slide because this is Sam who was hiding behind his mom in that first picture you saw. So by two o'clock um, on the end of his first day in preschool, when I walked out and he saw the camera in my, uh, the phone in my hand, he said, take my picture. So I don't think he was too scared anymore. I do want to make sure that everyone knows, most of all, we are in the business of making sure our students are learning and progressing. Um, we wanna make sure that they're fully included in their community right now as three to five year olds. But um, when they're 25 um, years old, 20 years from now, we wanna make sure as adults, they're living as fully contributing and equal members of society. And I wanna thank our staff member, Valerie Lancaster, this bulletin board was her idea. She put it all together. And this is just um, her idea, her symbolism of the diversity and the full inclusion that we um, operate through Star County Board of DD.
Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. We can see it. Awesome. So welcome to the start of um, our school programs for 2021. Our total, our goals this year are not different than any other year. We always include student safety and number one priority is education. Um, this picture was a first day picture from one of our students. As you can see, he's wearing his mask and his teacher's social distancing. And um, I asked him, I said, Cam, do you want me to take your picture? You can't tell, but he is smiling from ear to ear underneath the mask. He was so excited to be back at school, as were the rest of us. So looking at the national, state, and parent input, we took a lot of time to um, look at all those aspects. And I just wanted to share with you one conversation I had with a parent who called. Um, we continue to have parents calling, asking questions, and trying to give them the best answers possibly can. Um, but this parent was really struggling with their child. Um, their child had had some uh, health concerns rise over the uh, summer, and the student was now on oxygen and was very concerned about the fact that they were really scared to send their child to school. So I talked to them, and uh, and I had a long discussion about the options that are available for students this year. And when we got finished, I told her that no option was the wrong option. It was the right option for them. And she um, expressed her appreciation. And she said she's so excited that she was still going to be able to get services as a support. And that we would be able to support her child in a different mode, but be able to support her and was relieved that she would get to continue in school. When she first talked to me, she was pretty adamant that she thought that this was the end of school for her child. So we were really excited that it is not the end for her and she will be in one of our remote learning classes. So I'll just explain real quick our four, our four learning models for students. Um, we have a blended model, which is students coming in person. All of them will have a remote component to that, but some parents have requested that they don't want additional support. They felt that they could do it on their own and so requested not to have someone coming in the home and give that added support. The second is a blended in-person with remote learning and that is in-home support, which means that on the days that the student was not scheduled to be in person, that they would have the opportunity to have a staff person from their classroom, and we have been calling them pods, that they would be um, kind of contained to an area, to a grouping of students, that they would be able to go in the home and help that student get on a Chromebook, be able to do activities, educational programming, log on to the um, teacher doing a WebEx lesson, and all those things to add support at the home that we weren't um, equipped and ready to do in March as we are now, so really excited about that. The other two then are remote only instruction. And one of those again is remote at home, no support, and then remote instruction with home support. So right now we were fortunate enough to be able to get Chromebooks for technical assistance for a lot of our families. And we assigned staff to do in-person support. So each person is assigned only to one student. So that staff person isn't going from one student home to another student home. They're being assigned individually to ensure safety for everyone. And then we're following protocols that were actually put in place when we started having to help with respite in March for students who needed some support to ensure safety for students and staff prior to going into the home. And those some of those items are calling the night before, making sure that no one's been sick in the home, making sure that they know that we're going to be wearing PPE when we come to the home, we'll wear our mask and our shields. And then we also ask that if possible, that the family would also wear a mask and that the student can if possible. And we provide those items for them if they don't have them themselves. So as Tammy already talked to you about, we do have two teams this year. We have a red team and a yellow team. 
students attend two days a week each week. So no, no one is out unless they're remote only. No one is out an entire week. They're in session every two day, every week for two days. So we do uh, nine classes with our red team and eight classes with our yellow team. And then on Wednesdays, not only are we doing prep work and cleaning, but we are also making that our total training day, which includes our band, CPR, med certification, and any in-services that we might have will always be on those Wednesdays when no students are in the building so that you know, we're not taking away from any other student days. Um, this was created so we could create a 50% reduction of people in the building, which was considered to be a better uh, meet for us because we had um, a pretty large size of people coming into the building. So when we created the teams, we made sure that all of our class sizes are um, six students or less and ancillary services are um, along with teacher direct instruction are the priority when our students are in. We want to make sure that they're getting all their therapy needs met. We're making sure that goals are being addressed, whether it's APE goals or speech goals or the teacher generated goals. And we also have created individual bins for students and clear dividers so that we're able to um, give the students space. So if they are wearing a mask, they can take it off at times and be able to have that downtime while they're working on something by themselves and then wear a mask as they need to. Right now we have developed a um, platform on Schoolology. It's a free platform for us right now. And what we've done is teachers have created classrooms and within those classrooms, they create folders by the week and then each day of the week. So Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, students can log in with their Chromebooks that they're gonna be getting and they'll be able to participate in lessons, watch videos, go to links for our online curriculum and be able to actually do fill-in work to be completed with their Chromebooks. So some of the redesign that we've done for our students and our staff is we are not doing any congregate setting activities. Um, everything has been split and designed for individual time slots. So an example of that would be recess. All students still receive recess, but they've been scheduled out to a specific time so that they're able to go in. The kids have um, the large gym and the small gym areas to be able to do recess. And then the staff, again, use the cleaning protocols, clean everything down before the next class comes in, and we keep ro rotating as, as that schedule is um, happening. Breakfast and lunch, we're still serving both of those also, but right now we're doing it in the classroom because our lunchroom does not allow for the uh, social distancing aspect. So we've changed that room into a larger area for our staff to be able to have lunch, uh, and social distance, and also where um, copiers are, our Ellis machines and our mailboxes are now in place. So again, gym classes are scheduled individually, and we're right now, because it's such nice weather, encouraging everyone to go outdoors and use the natural settings outside to work and social distance as they're able to. So as you can see, some of the physical changes, the classrooms have been, um, um, so I, I might call them a little less cluttered, but they're more in coral, carol settings. And we also have dividers in place. The office area has um, added some of that partitioning so that we're able to social distance. The secretaries are in close uh, quarters there. And then as you can see on the floor to the far right, we did put down social distancing markers so the kids can see a traffic pattern and can also social distance in the hallways when they're out and about. Um, some other things that we've done is we created an isolation room, which is for um, students if they get ill or show signs of illness during school, can go to that room separate than the clinic and can be evaluated by the nurse to see if they are symptomatic for COVID. And then they would remain in that area until a family member could pick them up and take them home so that we've kind of kept them away from the rest of the group. We've also added signs, um, which are hand washing, cleaning, using mask posters that are all throughout the building right now. Posters were actually created by ODE 
and those are in all classrooms and all areas that students and staff are in the building. So where do we stand today? Right now we have an enrollment of 99 students, which is um, almost identical to last year. Uh, we have 23 student families currently who have chosen some type of remote in-home learning. Nine of those families have requested that they do not want anyone coming into the home but want to do online and our packets for educational programming. 14 students right now with their families are looking for that in-home support for us to help engage the student when they are at home. So that's where staff are going in and are helping support the families. Um, those are follow-alongs and assistants who are into the homes and help supporting those families to get their packets done and to also be engaged on the Chromebook. Currently, we have about 10 student packets that are still out there, and some of those families are trying to make their final decision as to what they want for the educational format for their student for the year. So to give you an idea where we stand right now, um, our red team is done for the, for the two weeks. Um, they were here Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, out of 51 students on the red team, we had 29 students in person Friday and Thursday, and we had 30 students, 33 students in attendance today. So it seems to be going rather well. Um, I get to walk around and see kids being engaged again. Um, staff are excited to see their students back in, and students seem to be acclimating very well. We have students who wear masks and um, seem to be um, fine with that, and other students who aren't, we're not addressing, we ask them. When they go out for a walk, do you want to wear a mask? If they decline, we go ahead, but our staff are always prepared and wearing those. So that's um, pretty much the end of mine. I didn't know if you guys had any questions, um, but thank you for letting me do a little presentation. Oh, thank you. That was good. Good. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Myrna and Tammy. Uh, good to see the schools are doing well and coping, coping with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving on, there's uh, we do not have any old business or new business uh, at this time. We'll have a review of policy slated for first readings and county Bolton will present. Good evening again. Um, policy 2.25 mileage reimbursement was reviewed and no changes recommended. Policy 3.05 face coverings is a new policy. Um, the CDC, along with state and local health departments and the Ohio Department of Education, recommended that we have a face covering policy in place, especially during this time of COVID-19, to keep employees, visitors, and students safe and, and healthy. Our policy provides direction on how the face covering should fit and what it should be made of. The policy also states that there are specific exemptions regarding the use of a face covering involving employees, visitors, and students, but those are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And in addition to the policy, there is a very detailed procedure that provides additional information. Policy 3.06, smoking and use of other tobacco products was reviewed with no changes recommended. And policy 4.10, performance evaluations was reviewed and no changes were recommended. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Now we'll move to uh, resolutions and we have many, so we'll get started. We're gonna handle resolutions 083220 and 083320, approved board expenditures for June and July. We'll handle those together. Uh, and um, I need a motion. Yeah. Second? Anderson seconds. Good discussion from Lee. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll put these up on the, uh, and I'll try to scroll down so you can see them all. Um, so here we're looking at our June operating statement. So for the month of June, total local revenues received of 2.3 million. We did receive our first half real estate uh, rollback. Uh, total state revenue received 361,000. 
Total federal received uh, 452,000 for total revenue of 3.08 million. Um, I will go over year to date when we hit July, so I'm not gonna go into that detail right now. Looking down at the expenses for June, we had two payrolls during the month, 1.23 million. Total benefits paid of 699,000 and total other expenses of 214,000 totaling expenses of 2.14 million. Our revenue, because of that uh, rollback, exceeded our expenses by 934,000. With a year-to-date positive variance of 3.5 million. Going down to the bottom, looking at our cash, we started the year with, I'll look, we'll start right here. We started the year with 50.1 million. And down here at the bottom, our current purchase orders at the end of June were 13.6 million. Um, with our positive net change of position of three and a half million, canceled 2019 POs of 458,000, left us with 39.7 million in uh, cash at the end of June. Moving over to July, July was a little light on the revenue side. Um, in total for the whole month, we only received 382,000. Um, and most of that was up, you could see in local of 156 and state of 222. Looking over at our year to date, um, I will note our, the 2020 was the first collection for the pipeline. So we'll see that positive variance reflect in our real estate tax settlements here. Um, and just some of the variance denoted, we did down at the bottom looking at the federal we received cost report settlement in 2019, which we have not received one yet this year, but we did receive um, waiver reconciliation along with additional HPC funding for the DSP wage increase, but we're still showing a negative year to date. I just wanted to point those out. Looking at our expen expen expenditures, wages, we had two payrolls during the month of July, 1.16 million. Uh, total benefits, we did have a premium holiday. We have one in July, we have one in August. So no health benefits, which are about a half million dollars were paid during the month. And then total other expenditures of 4.36 million. So you, here you'll notice we did pay our waiver match. We paid the first quarter of fiscal year 21, along with the administrative fees. And we also paid our fifth invoice from fiscal year 20. Um, which only totaled about $90,000 due to the enhanced um, FMAP. Just looking at our year to dates here, we're going to continue to see this increase. Um, or actually, we will continue to see this increase in waiver match. However, because of the enhanced rate that we're paying right now, uh, it's saving us a lot of money. So it's looking like, you know, we, we, $2.6 million in the good because of this enhanced rate as compared to waiver match paid last year. Going down to the bottom towards the cash again, we started the year with 50.13 million. In July, at the end of July, we had 9.95 million in open purchase orders. Again, 458,000 in 2019 canceled POs added back to our cash balance. Um, but then because paying the waiver match, our Variance falls to negative for the year of 1.8 million of expenses over revenue. So ended in unencumbered cash at the end of July of 38.07 million. Any questions on either of those statements before I move on? Okay. So I'll just briefly go over June and I'll go in a little more detail on July, but here June, our year to dates and our Looking at the percentages, 54.39% of what we've expected to receive, um, and then expenditures of 24.118, 47.44%. Our target is 50%, so we're running good um, on revenue as well as expenses. We're running under. And then looking all the way over here to the far right, our total available budget at the end of June, which mostly is made up of payroll, this line item here, which you can see is 8 million, uh, remaining budget of 13.09 million. Then we have July. July, we're looking for a target of about 58%. So 
So our revenue, you know, it's lagging a little bit this month, but that doesn't mean a thing. It's all about timing. So 55.14% of revenue received in, and then down in our expenditures, 29.82 million. So we're pretty much right on target with that 58% uh, paying the waiver match. And again, looking over in our available budget, mostly made up of payroll of 11.05 million for year to date. I only did one prior year encumbrance report because they were the same for both months. So 736,000 was carried over from 2019. We paid 249,000 year to date. Um, we've canceled 458,000 and 28,000 remains. That will probably go away most likely in either August or September as it's made up of the remaining balance due for the construction on the workshop floor. So looking at resolution 83220, again, you could see here we had two payrolls, um, nothing really ordinary paid in those payrolls other than personal day payout and some special Olympic stipends. And then the bottom, our total non-payroll of 913,000. If there are no questions, I'll, I'll move to the site. Do you want me to just go do both resolutions at once, Stan, for the approval? Uh, yeah, please, okay. please. We'll, handle, we'll handle them together. But. Okay. All right, then looking at resolution 83320, again, two payrolls. So we're getting into summer. So payrolls are a little bit lower because the school is not in session. So two payrolls of 1.16 million. Total non payrolls, and you can see in this last week, our waiver match payment came out that week. So total non payroll of 4.5 million. If there's no questions, I'll request approval for resolution 83220 as well as 83320. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no uh, questions on those resolutions, all in favor uh, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Extensions. Financials for June and July are approved. Moving to resolution 083420, approving the professional services contract with the Stark County Educational Service Center. I need a motion. Problem yeah. moves. Second. Smith, second. Uh, thank you. And uh, discussion from Erna, please. Good evening again, everyone. Um, the reason for this resolution is um, one of the goals that we've always had with our embedded classroom is to be able to get our students prepared to go back to their home district if um, that is warranted. And that's the goal is to always try to um, have our students return to the district where their siblings and their friends also go to school. So when we transition students back to the districts, sometimes parents had concerns about the fact that ancillary services are now different and it's not our therapy staff anymore, it's other staff who really aren't familiar with our students. So we've had the opportunity to be able to contract with the ESC who provides those um, ancillary services, um, OT, speech, and um, OT speech and, and PT. And then that way, when they do transition, a lot of times those ESC staff are the same staff that the districts are contracting. So there's kind of that carryover when they go back to the district. It's a familiar face. It's somebody who kind of knows those students. So it makes us, it's been making a smoother transition for our families. And so that concern has kind of gone away and it's worked really, really well. We began this initiative at the start of the 2014-15 school year and would like approval for us to continue with that service agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Myrna? With none, all in favor of resolution 083420, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No abstentions. Our resolution is approved. Our resolution 083520 approves purchase of Chromebooks for Southgate School. I need a motion. Giants moves. Second. Fabo Lang seconds. Thank you. We've got a discussion from Brandon. Uh, good evening. Uh, the IT department seeking approval to purchase 130 Chromebooks at a cost not to exceed $41,000. 
Uh, these devices will be deployed to 99 students and 18 teachers as part of our remote learning plan for Southgate students. Uh, the devices will be used by students who have chosen the remote learning option, uh, students who may have to be quarantined, and in the case that we get moved to a purple, uh, all students uh, will be assigned a Chromebook and um, be able to do remote learning with the, with the teachers from home. Uh, this will allow for continued education for all students, um, and the Chromebooks will have full WebEx capabilities and access to all necessary education uh, sites that the students will need to continue their education at home. Uh, so if there's no questions, uh, we're seeking approval. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Uh, all in favor of resolution 083520, say aye. 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 Jose nay. No abstentions, uh, re resolution is approved. Thank you. Then we've got uh, resolution 083620, approving amendment of the 2020-21 program calendars. I need a motion. Giants yeah. moves. Second. Balbo Lang second. Thank you, we've got discussion from Connie. Yes, this resolution outlines several revisions that are being made to the 2020-2021 school year calendars um, to include the first day of school at Southgate, moving from Wednesday, um, the 19th of August to Thursday, the 20th of August for students. And as Myrna outlined in her presentation, this really um, allowed the rotating student and staff schedule to begin efficiently on Thursday and then continue rotating Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as a day of um, cleanup and sanitation and preparing instructional packets. Um, also in service at Southgate had been scheduled for Friday 9-11 and that's being moved to Wednesday 9-9. And also in January, we're moving in service day from January 15th, which is a Friday, to Wednesday, January 13th. So um, by changing the, these dates from a Friday to a Wednesday, we'll eliminate the loss of two student in-person days. Also graduation is changing um, from May 21st to Friday, May 28th, that's 2021. And that really is to ensure that all final data is completed and collected for the completion of the progress reports. So though we don't often make changes to our calendar once they're approved, the COVID-19 emergency required the changes that I've mentioned um, to ensure that the best possible environment exists for our students and for our staff. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or discussions for Connie? If none, all in favor of resolution 083620, say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. No abstentions. Uh, resolution is approved. Now we can move on to second reading and board, board policies presented at the June board meeting, and they'll be presented by Connie. Policy 1.04 appearance and presentation before the board was reviewed with no changes recommended. Policy 2.04, approval of manuals, handbooks, and resource directories was also reviewed with no changes recommended. And finally, policy 2.27, managing cost-effective residential support services was also reviewed with no changes recommended. Thank you. Thank you. Resolution, uh, we just uh, resolution 06-3820, uh, providing Approval for board policies presented for second reading. We need a motion. Charlie's moves. Second. Anderson second. Yes. Uh, any further discussion on the board policies? With none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No abstentions. Uh, board policies are approved. Okay, now we're going to uh, move to executive session. And uh, I would like to uh, motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing matters required uh, to be kept confidential by federal law or regulations or state statutes. Iggy moves. Second. 
And Falvo Lang seconds. Then we'll do a roll call vote. Jim Anderson. Present. Um, it's, a, it's a vote, so we say uh, no. yes or no. <laughs> no problem. Aye. Dr. Falvo Lang. Yes. Dr. Giants. In here, Roger. I said yes. Oh, okay, sorry. thank you. Uh, Maria Higgy. Yes. Uh, Carmelita Smith. Yes. Cindy Sutter. Yes. And uh, Dan Sutter. Yes. Okay, we need to pause here because I need an okay from Brandon that we're secure and no longer on Facebook Live so that we can go into executive session. Actually, before we do that, we would announce that we're in executive session at 7.06.